uh, you could, um, I'm, so, I'm sorry, in, in Libya, if you could reflect on uh, what has happened in Libya as well, and, uh, and to some degree, whether the, uh, the end of what happened to Mubarak did not then cause the other dictators of the region to decide they've had to fight to the death uh, to stay, uh, uh, to prevent uh, the uh, being put on trial as Mubarak uh, was put on trial. Yeah, I mean, it was really an incredible year to be able to witness two revolutions. Um, you know, something I, I never expected in my lifetime. And, you know, all of what happened over this past year um, across uh, the region, I think, has taken everyone by surprise, including people in the region. Um, and certainly the U.S. government and, uh, most importantly, the leaders who, um, I think, assumed that they could continue to hold on to power um, until they, they died. And uh, what we've seen in, in Libya, what we're seeing in Syria, and what's, you know, things are changing a bit in Yemen now, um, is that these leaders do not want to give up power and will really hold on, do anything it takes to maintain their grip on power. Um, one of the things that was really remarkable um, um, over the past year that I saw in both Egypt and Libya is, um, is the fearlessness of people. Um, I was really taken aback by, you know, we've seen visually these scenes of crowds of people running into armed tanks, running into, you know, vehicles towards them that are opening fire, um, people just without any fear. And I think it's this, people talked about the fear barrier being broken. And I think um, what happened in both Egypt and Libya and also in Bahrain and Syria and Yemen um, is, is the sense that there's something more important um, than being afraid of being injured, of being killed, of being tortured, of being imprisoned, um, which was all a reality for many activists in this region for decades. And certainly this only multiplied over this year um, in Egypt alone over the past year. Um, you know, as many as a thousand people have been killed, if you count the number of deaths during the uprising and then in subsequent clashes. Um, and in Libya, that number is much, much higher. It's uh, hard to put an exact death toll, but it could be in the thousands, it could be in the tens of thousands, the numbers of people who have been killed and are missing. Um, but there is a very clear sense. Now, the idea that she even is talking about thousands or tens of thousands um, without any attribution of source, um, one uh, uh, could be cautious, but it's very clear to uh, that all cited uh, uh, estimates of Libyan casualties are not in the thousands. They are in the tens of thousands, as I indicated, between 30 and 50,000 people. And note that she has not yet told us any specific name. It's been all anecdotal up to this point and her own feelings about how marvelous it is that people are risking their lives. Uh, that is perhaps true, but we don't have a single fact yet, just uh, anecdotal sentiments. In, in both countries, that the fight was worth it. Um, it's been ugly, um, particularly in Libya. We've seen um, it, it stretched on for many months, um, NATO's involvement. Many people had very many questions about it, what this meant for the legitimacy of their struggle. But I think for people in Libya, the, the, the overwhelming sense that I got is that the most important goal for them was to get, was to topple their regime. And they were so inspired by what they saw in Tunisia and Egypt. Um, and every time one dictator fell or took a beating, there was a sense, there was a renewed sense of optimism around. So when Tripoli fell, there was excitement in the streets of Cairo um, and in Bahrain and in Yemen and Syria. Um, uh, you know, there is also this, you know, there, there's a real, um, I think, realization and acknowledgement on the part of uh, many people in Libya and in Egypt that the struggle, that the road ahead is going to be paved with struggles and it's not going to be an easy road. Many people feel that really hard work begins now. Um, so it remains to be seen how people will... Okay, so in the case of this business about how the really hard work is going to be now, uh, this is exactly what Hillary Clinton uh, said. This is a talking point from the Western leadership. And again, so far, no facts. Okay, let's go back and see.
continue to fight to keep their voices heard. Since uh, the revolution in Egypt, 12,000 people now being put before military trials, 12,000 people in Libya, what, 7,000 the rebels have detained? Yeah, the UN just came out with a report that, uh, you know, says that 7,000 people have been detained by um, different militias in Libya, loosely under the control of the Transitional National Council. Um, this is disturbingly high in a country where tens of thousands of people were imprisoned under Gaddafi, and one of the main reasons... Okay, here we go again. Tens of thousands of people were incarcerated by Gaddafi. According to the United Nations and the main statistical website uh, that compiles the CIA World Factbook, every conceivable one, which is called nationmaster.com, I suggest you check it out. Um, there were 9,000 prisoners in Libya. So basically, the political prisoners now are nearly at the same level. If we take the number 7,000, uh, which is a number provided by the very people that are incarcerating these people, so it's likely to be an underestimate, not to mention the ones that are already dead um, from being taken captive, because this is a very, very uh, hostile environment for the loyalists in Libya. Um, we're basically seeing that they've got locked down. She also didn't mention the fact that they're being tortured yet. Perhaps she will. I don't think she does. Uh, but she has got it all wrong. There were 9,000 prisoners in Libya total. Nine to 10,000, not tens of thousands. And those were common criminals. Libya had one quarter the incarceration rate of the United States. So we get this wrong. Uh, and I have actually went through all the Amnesty International reports, not for every single year, but for many years. And my estimate is around 50 to 80 people were killed a year for political reasons. Um, and there could be zero. This estimate is assuming this is occurring. If we look at the state of Texas alone, um, the uh, level of execution in the U.S. per capita is vastly higher. Let's continue that brought people out onto the streets was the repressive security yeah, state. with far less population than Egypt. With six million people, yes. yes. Um, so. Um, we so here Juan is trying to encourage her uh, to look at some relevant context. So far she hasn't given a single fact. She's had to been fed the facts by Juan and Amy. We talked to you uh, just after the fall of Gaddafi. You've been to Libya a number of times from Egypt, just going over the border. Uh, we spoke to you in Cairo just as you would come back, and with Mahmoud Mamdani, who's written extensively on the global implications of NATO's intervention in Libya. A big difference between Egypt and Libya was NATO's attack. I want to go to a clip of the Columbia University professor, Mahmoud Mamdani, um, talking about uh, a report that you had filed on post-Gaddafi Libya. I'm going to give you about 10 about seconds of this. His description um, is the backdrop is missing. Uh, the backdrop is uh, the manner of change in Libya. Um, the heavy involvement of external forces uh, in expediting uh, rapid fashion <clears throat> change in Libya. And that manner of involvement uh, being basically bombardment. Um, in East Africa, which is where I have been for the last uh, eight months, uh, this has been the cause of a huge concern. A uh, huge concern because uh, Libya is not atypical. Um, Egypt and Tunisia might be slightly atypical when it comes to the African continent. Okay, so let's skip ahead. You get the idea. He's going to be cautious, but he's going to call them out on this stuff. They're trying to have her refute this, and let's take a look at how that goes. It's of danger around the corner. That was uh, Professor Mahmoud Mamdani from Columbia University. Um,